hi everyone uh, i hope i'm uh, i'm audible okay if someone can confirm on the chat box if i am audible and my screen is visible yes ma'am yeah okay so today is the third problem solving session for the course experimental biotechnology so so far we have uh, learned about the good lab practices and uh, basics of electrophoresis so today we'll continue the topic electrophoresis the course instructor as you all know is professor vishal trivedi and uh, he is from iit guwahati and you have you must have seen his lecture videos uh yeah somebody is raising their hand do you have any question illumalai do you have any question the someone is asking where can i get the powerpoint slides so uh on your nptel uh, portal where you are seeing the lecture videos below the le like on the left hand side panel where you are where you can see week 1 week 2 below that only you can see the problem solving session uh, tab where you can click and uh, it will lead to you uh, it will lead you to an excel sheet and that excel sheet will have all the lecture videos as well as the slides uploaded on the drive Uh, do you have any question, Alumni? Good evening, ma'am. I am complete three weeks. Uh, complete, ma'am. Yeah. Fourth week, and there is some problem, ma'am. Uh, so for the fourth week, you will have another session on this Saturday, as well as my session will be on next Tuesday. So we can discuss the fourth week problems there. Today, I'll be discussing all the problems regarding the third week lectures. so uh, if you have any doubt in that we can have the discussion for the fourth week we will have the discussion uh, in the next okay. class okay okay uh, If you don't have any more question, can you mute yourself? Exam, exam applying last date, ma'am. Uh, it must have been announced on your NPTEL portal, right? Oh yes, ma'am. Okay, so we'll start the class now. So today is the third problem solving. Can you please uh, mute your mic? Let's start the class now. So, 
today is the third problem solving session for the uh, course experimental biotechnology today we will discuss more deeply about electrophoresis some different techniques of electrophoresis so previously in the uh, last session we discussed about vertical and horizontal electrophoresis how to separate yes, proteins sir. and dna majorly i request you to please unmute uh, please mute your mic it's causing a disturbance yeah thank you so much so today we will discuss more topic uh, more uh, advanced techniques of uh, electrophoresis and we'll tackle different problems uh, how and we'll see how different techniques can be used to solve different problems that arise during experimentation okay so i'll be solving the assignment like uh, questions related to your assignment in uh, given in this week and we you can have uh, you can ask me any doubt uh, that you have and i'll try to help you out okay so feel free to ask any question at any point whenever you find any difficulty just ask me the questions okay so starting with the first question which of the following statement is or are true about the stacking gel which of the following statement is or are true about the stacking gel the stacking gel solution contains acrylamide it is on top of the separating gel it is used to dilute the protein samples before it enters the main separating gel it is into this gel that the wells are formed and the proteins loaded so what would be the correct answer anybody who knows the answer can type in the chat box nobody knows the answer Okay, we have one answer from Rajpriya. Option A. We have one more answer. Option B. Okay, we are getting different conflicting answers. Anyone else wants to answer? So let's see the let's see one statement at a time. So the first statement say. says the stacking gel solution contains acrylamide is that true or false the first statement is true right because all the gels that we are polymerizing they contain acrylamide the acrylamide is the main component that is getting polymerized if you remember from the last lecture we have studied how the gel was polymerized so the gel was polymerizing uh, using acrylamide and base acrylamide and the uh, initiator of polymerization was ammonium persulfate and timid was added as the catalyst right so uh, if you remember uh, from the last lecture we uh, like i told you about the amount of acrylamide and uh, its relation with the pore size of the gel okay so stacking gel solution contains acrylamide that is correct answer that is a true statement second it is on the top of the separating gel is that true or false that is also a true statement right so it is present on the top of the separating gel so whenever we cast the uh, gel for sds phase we this is a vertical electrophoresis system right so we will have a glass plate in which first we will pour the separating gel right first we will pour the separating gel and then on top of that we will pour the stacking gel so stacking gel is present on top of the separating gel so that is a correct statement right and it is used to dilute the protein samples before it enters the main separating gel is this statement true or false 
do you think the third statement is true or false come on i need answers from you try to answer it otherwise you won't be able to understand okay rajpriya says it's a true statement suman is answering option c as the right answer okay so it is used to dilute the protein samples before it enters the main separating gel this is actually a false statement why do we pour the stacking gel we by name itself you can see stacking we need to stack all the protein samples in one line okay that is why we are pouring the stacking gel so it does not dilute the sample the sample concentration remains the same it just stacks the gel in one single line we will see how so this is a false statement so the third statement is incorrect the fourth statement it is into this gel that the wells are formed and proteins are loaded so that is a true statement because we have all the wells in this gel in which we load our protein samples so what does a stacking gel do so as you know this is a vertical electrophoresis right vertical electrophoresis that means you are loading the samples like this so these are the wells you are loading the samples like this now the sample will have different molecules a bigger molecule a smaller molecule right it's a mixture of proteins so what happens when you have a well like this so you can have a molecule 1 you can have a molecule 2 you can have a molecule 3 and molecule 4 okay now all these four molecules since you have loaded it in a vertical position even though they are in the same sample and even though let's say size of the first and fourth molecule is same okay now if the size of first and fourth molecule is same they should be present or they should be visualized together at the same position on gel but what will happen since you are loading in a vertical manner the first molecule is already behind the fourth molecule right so if we are running the gel in this direction the fourth molecule automatically will move faster than the first molecule because first molecule is already behind the fourth molecule right so if let's say we we have a race okay we have five contestants who are starting for the race so 1 2 3 4 and 5 okay we have five contestants who are starting for a race now if i don't start all like if i don't ask all the five people to run from the same point same starting point it won't be fair judgment to see who reaches first okay let's say this is the finish line if this is the finish line and i want to see which contestant is crossing the finish line uh fast the fastest how will i judge them if i don't start them at the uh at the same point so if i ask one to stand here and two to stand here and 3 4 5 to stand there one will naturally take more time to reach the finish line than 3 4 and 5 right so i cannot tell if first reached last in the race because it was standing behind or because it was actually a slower uh, person right so similarly in this case when we have four different molecules in the same well if we don't stack them at the same position like if they are not adjacent to each other then we cannot say which one is bigger molecule and which one is smaller molecule right so for that we cast the stacking gel now what does the stacking gel have so the correct answer is c 1 2 and 4 are the true statement So what does the stacking gel have the ph of the stacking gel is actually 6.8 so this gel in which we have casted the well so let's say 
this is my stacking part okay so these are my wells right and then i have the separating part okay so i have my molecule 1 and molecule 4 right now they are not in the same position so what will i do so in the stacking gel the ph is 6.8 and at this ph the glycine is moving slowly in front and where whereas tris hcl is moving fast so what will happen since glycine is moving slowly glycine will form a bridge here okay so glycine will form a bridge here and since tris is moving fast what will tris do tris tris hcl will start pushing all these molecules so tris hcl will push these molecules and glycine will stop these molecules so it's like a sandwich situation okay so it is like a sandwich situation so we have glycine okay we have glycine and we have tris here glycine is moving slowly so glycine is stacked somewhere here and tris is moving fast so when tris is moving fast it is kind of pushing all the molecules that are present in well and pressing it against glycine and it is getting sandwiched there so all the molecules will now come in a straight stacked line okay so what will happen tris will push these molecules and as a result and as a result what will happen first and fourth molecule will come in the straight line okay so once first and fourth molecule comes in the straight line then the separating gel will start and in the separating gel we have uh, the ph of separating gel is 8.8 where the glycine is now charged so glycine can also move faster okay glycine is negatively charged it will move faster tris was already moving faster so everything will now move fast and the separation will happen based on size so now first and fourth molecule based on size if the fourth molecule is smaller and first molecule is bigger fourth molecule will move further and first molecule will move slower okay just a second there's some issue with my screen i'll just stop presenting and present it again
just give me a minute. Please cooperate for five minutes. I'm trying to reconnect. Okay. I hope it is visible so as I was talking about the stacking gel so stacking gel basically has glycine 
uh, basically has a pH of 6.8 where glycine moves very slowly because it's near its pi okay so glycine is moving very slowly but tris is moving very fast so tris is kind of pressing sandwiching all the samples together so what will happen as a result as a result what will happen we will have a glycine and the tris pushing all the samples so the sample 1 and sample 4 they will come in same line and then after this we have the separating gel right after this we have the separating gel in the separating gel now these molecules now the separating gel has a ph of 8.8 so at ph 8.8 glycine is also moving fast so these two molecules will be separated based on its size in the same lane if fourth is a bigger molecule and one is a smaller molecule one will move faster and fourth will move slower okay so in your well in the wells we had one and four at different positions so this kind of pushes everything together and glycine has is making the sandwich uh blockage over the separating gel and once the separating gel begins the glycine is also moving fast so these molecules start moving in the well in that lane in that particular lane and separate based on their molecular sizes that is clear okay so now moving on to the next question question number 2 which of the following are the components of the loading dye in sds page in sds page which of the following are the components of the loading dye first is bromophenol blue second is temed third is glycerol fourth is beta mercaptoethanol and fifth is sds so what would be the answer anybody Yeah, we have Shahina says option D, one, three, four, and five. Yeah, that is the correct answer. One, three, four, and five. That is bromophenol blue, glycerol, beta mercaptoethanol, and SDS. So, the loading dye basically the well that I've talked about in the previous slide. So that well will have samples, and the loading dye will be loaded with the sample. So we will mix our sample. loading dye plus our protein so we will always prepare the sample with the loading dye what will this loading dye do so we have first component bromophenol blue why do we add this this is act as the tracking dye okay this is called the tracking dye so when we are running the gel at that time we are not doing the staining right so how do we know how much our gel has run so if i have the gel the vertical gel and this is the wells part of that so i have loaded my sample in this well okay this is the stacking gel here the samples will be stacked and then start running but we cannot see the proteins right we cannot see the protein by naked eye so how do we know if the sample has run because if we keep on running after a certain point the proteins will come out in the buffer right so we have to stop the gel once the gel has completely run that is the track the tracking dye that bromophenol blue that we are adding in this loading dye this bromophenol blue will be visible as a thin line after the stacking has been done we can see a thin line thin blue line and that blue line will keep moving and once that blue line will reach the end of the gel we will stop running the gel and start with the staining procedure okay so bromophenol blue is added to the loading dye for tracking how much we have run the gel then we have glycerol we don't we add, where do we add temed we don't add temed in loading dye we add temed in during the polymerization of the gel temed acts as a catalyst for polymerization okay temed adds uh, acts as a catalyst for polymerization okay now glycerol 
why do we add glycerol in the loading dye so now you know we are loading the samples in the well right these wells are thin narrow vertical wells right so when we are loading the sample we want all the sample to move down and settle in the well we don't want any sample to uh, come out of the well or come out and move into some other well so that will be contamination of the sample right so we want all the samples to move swiftly down so you know glycerol is highly viscous right glycerol is a viscous liquid right so because of the viscosity because of the high viscosity glycerol will always go down glycerol has a higher density right higher density means glycerol will go down even when buffer is filled so these wells will have buffer filled when we are loading the sample right so this glyc because of the glycerol our sample will directly go down it will not diffuse out of the well okay then comes beta mercaptoethanol why do we add beta mercaptoethanol what is beta mercaptoethanol doing beta mercaptoethanol basically reduces the disulfide bond okay reduces the disulfide bond so any disulfide bond that is present between two cysteine residues or two different subunits beta mercaptoethanol can reduce the disulfide bond into individual sh okay so what will happen because of beta mercaptoethanol our protein will get completely denatured okay beta mercaptoethanol will separate the subunits of the protein by reducing the disulfide bond then comes sds what is sds doing sds is sodium dodecyl sulfate right so what does sds do it is an anionic detergent so you have to remember sds is an anionic detergent both the terms in this word is important both anionic and detergent it is important so what is anionic means anionic means negatively charged right so because of its anionic nature it is imparting a negative charge to our protein samples because of its negative nature sds is imparting a negative charge on the protein sample so irrespective of protein's natural charges SDS will impart a overall negative charge to this protein and because SDS uh, provides a negative charge the protein will move towards the positive electrode right so here in this electrophoretic system we will have the negative electrode on top positive electrode on bottom and the current will flow and the protein samples will move towards the positive electrode because it is coated with a negatively charged molecule an anionic molecule that is giving them a negative charge and it will be attracted towards the positive electrode okay now comes the detergent what does a detergent do detergent can denature a protein so basically we have a folded protein right something like this we have folded protein so what will sds do sds will enter into the protein molecule and open it in a linear long uh, polymer uh, linear long polymeric chain okay so it's a polymer of amino acids right protein is a polymer of amino acids so it will open up the protein structure the three dimensional protein structure into a single thread of amino acids okay so how does it open it up since it's a detergent it's a amphiphilic molecule that means it has a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail right it has a hydrophilic head that is negatively charged and a hydrophobic tail this hydrophobic tail will interact with the hydrophobic amino acids that are present inside the protein okay and open that protein structure completely and along with opening it will 
so basically something like this is happening to the whole protein structure the hydrophobic tail will attach to the hydrophobic amino acid and these hydrophilic head groups that are there in SDS the negatively charged head groups they will protrude out of the protein sample and give an overall negative charge to the protein ok so SDS is very important in the loading die because that is the basis of separation otherwise the separation won't happen based on size so when we are doing SDS page the separation is happening based on size of the molecule right but if we do not add SDS in this what will happen the separation will happen based on charge by mass ratio okay electrophoretic mobility the separation happens based on charge by mass ratio but since we are giving all the protein same charge so the charge factor is nullified here and the mobility is inversely proportional to mass that is higher the mass slower will be the mobility ok so SDS is very important in the loading dye beta mercaptoethanol if you want to reduce the disulfide linkages you have to add beta mercaptoethanol bromophenol blue is very important because you want to see how much your gel has uh, run through the system because if you if you over run your gel or if you if you overrun your gel your proteins will come out of the gel and you won't be able to see your desired protein if you under run your gel if you do not run the gel completely let's say you run your gel only till here then you won't see enough resolution of different proteins separation between different proteins to uh, analyze your protein of interest ok so bromophenol blue is very important to track where how much my gel has completed its run ok and glycerol is very important otherwise you won't be able to load the samples in the well the samples will diffuse out of the well ok this is clear So correct answer is option D as you all answered correctly. So moving on to the next question, question number 3. A protein shows a molecular weight of 70 kilodalton in SDS page and 140 kilodalton in native page. What is the oligomeric status of the protein? Option A 2, option B 4, option C 18 and option D 80 what would be the oligomeric state of the protein if it is showing one band of 70 kilodalton on SDS page and one band of 140 kilodalton on native page yeah we have answered China says 2 Ami also says option 1 yes so oligomeric status of the protein is 2 that is the correct answer how do we find that out let's see so if you do not uh, know any formula or anything then also by logic you can see I just now I told you what do you mean by SDS page it is denaturation page right you are denaturating the sample so whatever uh, oligomers are present so if it is a dimer or trimer everything will break into monomer ok so on SDS page if you are getting a band at 70 kilodalton and on native page you are getting a band of 140 kilodalton that means there is a dimer that is present of homodimer that is present so 270 kilodalton proteins are interacting together to make a 140 kilodalton homodimer right so in native page since there is no bromophenol blue and no SDS what will happen the whole protein will run as a single band but in SDS page the protein will break into two parts 270 kilodalton fraction and it will run as a thick band of 70 kilodalton on SDS page because we have added 
beta mercaptoethanol and SDS in the loading dye. Okay, so correct answer is option A. So there is a simple uh, formula also to find out the molecular uh, to find out the oligomeric status. So it is basically the fraction of molecular weight that we found on native page divided by the molecular weight that we found on SDS page. So here the molecular weight on native page was 140, the molecular weight on SDS page was 70. So we get 2 as the answer. Okay. So my answer is op uh, option 1 that is option A that is 2. Okay. Oligomeric status of this protein is that is it has two monomers that is forming a homodimer ok since both the monomers are of same uh, molecular weight we call it homodimer ok uh, sure I can explain it again so we had on SDS page we were getting the molecular weight of 70 kilodalton so when we are running the gel, we are getting one band at 70 kilodalton, okay, on SDS page. When we are running native page, when we are running native page, I am getting a band of 140 kilodalton, okay. So that means the protein, native page will give you the native molecular weight of the protein because there is no denaturation happening, there is no uh, beta mercaptoethanol to reduce the disulfide bond that means whatever the molecular weight of the protein, so native page the separation will happen based on the charge by mass ratio, ok. So both charge and mass of the protein will affect its mobility. So from the native page gel if we find out that the protein is 140 kilodalton and when we did SDS page we saw a band at 70 kilodalton that means there is some so some part of 140 is going into 70 right so if I know the mole total molecular weight is 140 and out of which there are parts that are 70 kilodalton so that that is only possible when we will have 270 kilodalton proteins right 270 kilodalton protein will make up to 140 kilodalton simply by dividing 140 by 70 we can see right so that means there are two units of 70 kilodalton that are attached together probably by disulfide bonds and different other uh, interaction so these two units are attached together so when we are running native page there is no breaking of these units there is no SDS there is no beta mercaptoethan also the unit ran together as a 140 kilodalton protein but when in SDS page what is happening we are adding SDS we are adding beta mercaptoethanol so all these things are breaking this protein into two fractions so we have now 270 kilodalton separate protein right so now even if they are two separate 70 kilodalton molecules since the molecular weight is same and the separation is only happening based on molecular weight so in this the separation will happen only based on the molecular weight okay in this the separation was happening based on charge by mass ratio ok but in this the separation will happen based on molecular weight so 270 kilo Dalton molecules will run as a at, um, like will stop at the same location on the gel right so we will get a thicker band probably this band will be thicker than the native band ok so you can see that say that ok there are two different molecules of 70 kilodalton present and in this only one molecule of 140 kilodalton present ok do you understand Suman yes ma'am so 
coming to the next question question number 4 a protein molecular weight of 360 kilo dalton shows two bands on hds page when loaded with beta mercaptoethanol corresponding to their sizes 100 kilo dalton and 30 kilo dalton okay when the same protein is loaded on a native page it gave three bands corresponding to the size 200 kilo dalton 100 kilo dalton and 60 kilo dalton how many subunits are present in the protein now this is just a detailed version of the previous question so uh, try to solve it and uh, let me know if anyone can answer this question if you understood the previous question you should be able to answer this question so options are option a a monomer of 60 kilo dalton and a trimer of 100 kilo dalton option b a dimer of 100 kilo dalton and a dimer of 30 kilo dalton and a monomer of 100 kilo dalton option c monomer of 200 kilo dalton a monomer of 100 kilo dalton and a dimer of 30 kilo dalton and option d a dimer of 100 kilo dalton and a monomer of 60 kilo dalton so what would be the correct answer here if anybody can answer shaina says option c okay a monomer of 200 kilo dalton a monomer of 100 kilo dalton and a dimer of 3 uh, 30 kilo dalton okay we have one more answer option b dimer of 100 dimer of 30 and a monomer of 100 okay so let's see how to solve this question so we have on sds page we are getting two bands right so in the previous question i uh, explained if on sds page we are getting two bands and on uh, native page we are getting different bands how to analyze so on sds page we had a 100 kilo dalton and a 30 kilo dalton band okay on native page we have three bands we have a 200 we have a 100 and we have a 60 now if you see the options a monomer of 60 mon if there was a monomer of 60 we would have seen it in sds page also so whatever we saw on sds page definitely these are the monomeric form right so either there is a monomer of 30 or a dimer of 30 that is making the 60 now we don't see a 60 kilo dalton band here so there is no monomer of 60 so that means there is a dimer of 30 okay so dimer of 30 kilo dalton is actually correct so both the options have that next let's see we have a 100 kilo dalton band here we but we got a 200 kilo dalton band here that means we have a dimer of 100 also that that's how we got a 200 we did not get a 200 band on sds page if there was a monomer of 200 we would have gotten a band on sds page that was corresponding to 200 kilo dalton since we got a band of 100 kilo dalton on sds page and a 200 kilo dalton of uh on native page that means there is a dimer of 100 kilo dalton and since we got one more band of 100 kilo dalton on native page as well that means there is a separate monomer of 100 kilo dalton so this protein is basically a complex protein which has a dimer of 100 kilo dalton a monomer of 100 kilo dalton and a dimer of 30 kilo dalton all are in close proximity and all are somehow interconnected to each other okay so this is a huge complex protein of 360 kilo dalton total which has a dimer of 100 dimer of 30 and a monomer of 100 kilo dalton so option b is the correct answer here Do you understand? Ma'am, so in SDS there is three bands of hundred, right? In SDS, sorry. In SDS there are three total bands of hundred. 
so uh, that is what i was explaining so whenever you are running sds space even if you have three molecules of 100 kilo dalton or five molecules of 100 kilo dalton they will all uh, come as a single band okay so you cannot figure out how many uh, bands are there of a particular molecular weight so if it is a 30 kilo dalton band there will be only single band of 30 kilo dalton anything above that will be a 31 or 40 or 50 like that right anything below that will be lesser than 30 so band on sds page will be single now when we run sds page and native page simultaneously we can actually figure out how many subunits are there so if i if i am running on sds page if i am running the protein on sds page and i get a single band at 30 kilo dalton but on native page i am getting a single band at 60 kilo dalton that means we have a protein that is a dimer of 30 kilo dalton that's why when we are running the sds page the 60 kilo dalton protein was breaking into 30 30 kilo dalton uh, subunits and was running so we will get one single band they have two 30 kilo dalton subunits but we will get a band of one uh, 30 kilo dalton only because the separation is based on size so two molecules of same size will come as a single band so even if you have a mixture of two different proteins of the same molecular weight exactly same molecular weight they will run as a single band you cannot separate those two molecules that have the same size because the separation is based on size right for sds page the separation is based on size so if your uh, like if your sizes are same you cannot separate those two proteins using sds page do you understand is yes ma'am but compared to if uh, if i'm doing a sds page knowing that i am giving a 100 kb sample hmm. uh, uh then it will give 100 kb uh, band yes. from then compared to this uh, this 100 kb, KB will have a thicker band yes respect the, to that yes the intensity of the band will can be thicker or thinner based on the number of molecules so let's say i have a uh, let's say for example I have a hexamer hexamer means we have 6 subunits so let's say I have a hexamer of uh, 50 kilo dalton protein ok so that means 6 subunits of 50 kilo dalton are present ok so total protein is 300 kilo dalton when I will run a native page I will get a single band of 300 kilo dalton okay but when i'll run a sds page i will get a thick 50 kilo dalton band okay because one one band on native page will correspond to six 50 kilo dalton bands do you understand so intensity of the band can be thicker but the position of all the 50 Six fifty kilo dalton bands all the 50 kilo dalton subunits that are present so all six of them will come together as a single band on the gel okay the band can be thicker or thinner based on the concentration but it will come as a single band you cannot see two separate bands of 50 kilo dalton the separation is based on size so if the size is same they cannot be separated okay so they will come at the same location as a single band the band can be thicker based on the concentration now is it clear yes ma'am yes, ma understood yeah anyone else have any doubt no ma'am okay. so question number five Vertical streaking of protein bands and SDS page occur because Option A, it occurs because of overloading of protein sample Option B, it occurs because of underloading of protein sample Option C, it occurs due to uneven migration of protein sample 
and option D it occurs due to uneven heating of uh, uneven heating of the gel. So vertical streaking of protein bands and SDS page occurs because of what? Anybody? Okay, option C, uneven migration on protein samples. Uneven migration of protein samples. Okay. Amiya says overloading of protein samples. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Everyone has answered different options. So overloading of protein samples, underloading of protein samples, uneven migration of protein samples and uneven heating of the gel. Actually all four of these options can give a significant defect in the gel. So vertical streaking is actually due to overloading of protein samples. So we can have different defects on SDS page. By defects what do I mean? So ideally on SDS page we should get a one sharp single band like this okay for each protein size we should get single bands like this but a lot of times what happens we get a band like this we get a band like this we can get a band like this sometimes we get a band like this a smear of band so all these kind of problems occur due to different uh, issues while running the gel. So vertical streaking is a very common problem that occurs due to overloading of protein samples. So vertical streaking of protein, protein bands appear due to overloading of the protein sample and it can be corrected by either reducing the amount of protein or running the gel at a lower current. So at a lower current what will happen? The gel will run slower so slowly the resolution will occur happen so if there is vertical streaking of the gel that means there are streak lines like this between the protein or the protein bands have smeared like this so that means the resolution is not uh, nice because there's a lot of concentration of the protein the protein is proteins are unable to separate as two distinct bands so if you run it at a lower current it can separate as a two distinct band. So I have actually attached some examples of defects in the gel. So these kind of streak lines that you can see here, these are vertical streaking. This is also a problem due to overloading of sample. In this, in these two lanes, you can see the sample has been overloaded, and because of that, since the concentration of protein is so high, it is impossible for uh, SDS page to resolve the gel into separate bands. So see in this lane you can see we have separate bands right but in this lane can you differentiate between two bands no right because everything has merged together because so much of sample has been loaded same thing has happened here if you see this lane you can see separate bands separate straight bands are there but if you see this lane since amount of sample has been loaded like the excess amount of sample has been loaded you can see streaking of the sample right the sample has kind of smeared over the gel so this is a very bad uh, loading of gel. so these all these pictures that you see these are actually examples of uh, defects that arise during SDS page uh, analysis so what precautions you should take so that you do you get a clean gel with sep well separated band okay these kind of gels are not not appreciated okay these kind of gels are very uh, looks very bad and you cannot act it's not very conclusive you cannot conclude any result out of it so there is another defect called smiling smiling of the band so this is an example of smiling of the band so you can see an upward smile here you can see a downward smile here this is also smiling of the band this the bands are like this instead of straight lines okay so why that smiling occurs it occurs due to uneven heating of the gel so 
how the gel is getting heated when we are uh, when we are uh, supplying current to the gel when we are supplying a particular voltage to the gel due to the flow of current there will be some heat generated in the gel due to uneven heating it can cause differential migration so what do you mean by differential migration so this is the protein band that i desired to get but what will happen this part and this part will move faster whereas this part will move slower as a result what will happen we will get something like this the ends have moved faster but the middle part has moved slower or vice versa the ends have moved slower but the middle part part has moved faster and that's why we get the smiling band then we have diffuse protein band so if you see in this gel you can see the bands have diffused out so that can happen due to uh running the gel at a very uh, low current so if you increase the current a little bit so if you run the gel at a very low current what will happen there will be a lot of heating and the sample will be in contact with the buffer for a long time the sample can diffuse out of the gel okay so to prevent that we can increase the current by 25 to 50% and we can also use a higher acrylamide concentration in order for the proteins to remain in the gel and not diffuse out of the gel so this is an example of a diffused band then i already explained vertical streaking then we have another problem where proteins run faster than expected so let's say i am running some known protein i know the molecular weight of my protein is 60 kilo dalton but when i am running the gel i have the molecular marker also molecular marker means the standard that has a uh, mixture of different known protein uh, present so we can get uh, 90 kilo dalton 60 kilo dalton 30 kilo dalton these kind of separated bands and i will run my sample beside that molecular marker to see where my sample is uh, present on the sds page so my sample ideally should come beside the 60 kilo dalton band but it is moving faster than expected or slower than expected so why is that happening that means if my sample has unusual uh, unusual very high proportion of basic or amino acid that can cause intrinsic charge to the protein so i told you in sds page we are treating the protein samples with sds that means we are providing a overall negative charge to the protein but what if my protein was already negatively charged what if my protein has high negative charge present uh, already so what will happen because of that high negative charge and i am giving more negative charge so it will become highly negative and it will move faster than its expected molecular weight position okay so these are some kinds of defects we will discuss some more defects in the next question okay any doubt in these i have attached the gel picture so that you get an idea of how it actually looks to understand this problem better any doubt next question question number 6 appearance of the distorted protein bands in sds page can be troubleshooted by dash option a decreasing the amount of temed and aps option b increasing the voltage of power supply option c increasing the amount of temed and aps and option d decreasing the voltage of power supply so how can we uh, resolve the appearance of distorted protein band if i am getting distorted protein band what should i do okay we have one answer option a decreasing the amount of temed and aps okay anyone else actually the answer is option c increasing the amount of temed and aps what will so 
here we should mention the in, uh, increasing the amount of temid and ATS in the stacking gel mainly. So if you are getting distorted bands, so distorted bands or uneven protein bands is mainly due to the stacking gel polymerization. So if you increase the amount of APS and temid in the stacking gel, it can actually resolve that problem. So I have, so see this well, these are the example of distorted band. So when you are casting the gel, so when you are casting the gel, I told you, you have the separating gel and then on top of that you pour the stacking gel, right? But if this separating gel was not straight, if this separating gel had some deformities, so your stacking gel will also have these kind of bends and then when your protein is stacking here, your protein will stack like this and if your protein is stacking like that, your protein will run also like this and because of that, the bands will also be curved like this, okay? Or if you see here, your bands have these kind of distortion. So these distortion are due to uneven polymerization of this stacking gel. The stacking gel has not polymerized evenly. Here there is unevenness in the polymerization. So if we add temid and APS at a higher amount, what will happen? The polymerization will happen faster. So it can quickly polymerize. We It won't get enough time to pol, uh, distort in its shape. Okay. Second thing is de-aeration of the stacking gel. So whenever we are pouring the gel, when we pour the separating gel, it is a good practice to pour some amount of I isopropanol or IPA, isopropyl alcohol, some amount of IPA over the separating gel and once the separating gel solidifies, you remove the IPA and then pour the stacking gel. What does IPA do? IPA prevents the auto oxidation or air oxidation of the separating gel. So IPA actually prevents all these dips that are happening. These kind of problems will not happen if we pour IPA. Okay. Another defect that is there is double band. So appearance of double band is due to partial oxidation or degradation of the protein sample. So this can easily be re uh, remedied by preparing fresh samples or addition of more reducing agents. So if you are getting instead of one band, if you are getting two bands very close to each other, so that means there is partial degradation that is causing one bed to move faster than the other one okay and then there is lateral spread spreading if the protein bands appear laterally spreading it can be avoided by reducing the time between the loading sample and running so this is the example of lateral spreading so the gel should have run in this straight line but you can see the gel has kind of spread like that okay so why is this happening so when you are loading the samples on your well, so after loading the samples, you should not wait for a long time to run it. You should immediately load the sample and then start your run. If you wait for some time, what will happen? The samples will start diffusing into the gel in any direction because there is no particular current. So when we are applying current, the samples are moving in a straight line. But when there is no application of current i've just loaded the sample at that time the sample is free to diffuse in any direction so in those cases we get all these kind of lateral spreading this can also happen when uh, your buffer tank is leaking so uh, whenever we are running these sds gel we have a buffer between two gels and we have the buffer surrounding the gel okay so between these two gels, when we have the buffer, if that buffer is leaking somehow from any corner, then also because of that leak, it can cause this spreading. Okay. So is this clear? Do you understand what kind of defects can happen 
in the gel so these all are, all things are basically uh, these processes should be avoided so that you get nice and clear crisp bands on the SDS page whenever you are analyzing your protein sample ok so moving on to the next question question number 7 unfolding of a protein can cause dash which makes its mobility slower in the SDS page option A increase in charge option B increase in molecular mass option C increase in hydrodynamic volume and option D decrease in hydrodynamic volume so unfolding of protein can cause dash which makes it mobility which makes its mobility slower in the SDS page what would be the answer ok we have option C as the unanimous answer increase in hydrodynamic volume yes that is the correct answer so if we uh, if we denature the protein if we are unfolding the protein basically we, what we are doing we are opening up the structure that means its overall hydrodynamic volume is increasing right earlier it was a compact structure so it was hydrodynamically the volume of it was occupying and space was less but now we are opening it so its hydrodynamic volume is increasing because of this increase what is happening the movement of the protein will become slower so why is this becoming slower because now the volume is increased that means there will be more resistance while moving through the gel ok so if I make a very small paper ball and pass it through a pore it will pass uh, like it will pass very swiftly but now if I open it it will have some friction from the sides of the pore so it will not pass very swiftly right so there will be some resistance from the walls of the pore from the medium so be why because the hydrodynamic volume has increased so it will now in hinder while passing through those pores similarly for protein when the protein has been unfolded there is an increase in the hydrodynamic volume which causes the protein to move slower in the gel because of the resistance that is uh, caused by the gel ok so its mobility is slower in SDS page this is clear most of you have answered correctly so I hope you understand this part so option C is the correct answer moving on to the next question question number 8 dash atoms are used for labeling DNA for visualization in autoradiograph option A hydrogen option B boron option C phosphate and option D lithium which atom is used for labeling DNA for visualization and autoradiograph ok Suman has answered Shine has also answered option C phosphate yes that is the correct answer option C phosphate so DNA if you know the structure of DNA DNA has phosphate groups attached to it and those phosphate groups can be actually labeled with a radioactive phosphate P32 which is a heavy isotope of phosphate and if we label it with P32 we can actually see by uh, visualizing it on an uh, autoradiograph basically we can see the uh, DNA on any medium ok so option C phosphate is the correct answer so this is the structure of uh, DNA actually so we have the bases you know ATGC adenine uh, thymine guanine and cytosine we have four bases in the DNA so these nitrogenous bases are connected to a sugar molecule and a phosphate group so we have three components in the DNA phosphate sugar and a nitrogenous base so this whole component 
makes one nucleotide of DNA and these phosphates if we label these phosphates with a heavier isotope of phosphate that is P32 that labeled DNA can be used for visualizing by taking its radiograph ok. So, what do you mean by radiograph we basically see based on the radioactivity because the P32 is radioactive we can actually image it on a medium ok. So, phosphate is the molecule phosphate is the atom sorry that is labeled to visualize the DNA on a auto radiograph this is clear. So, coming to the next question, question number 9. Which of the following technique is used for purification of radioactive labeled oligonucleotides? Which of the following technique is used for the purification of the radioactive labeled oligonucleotides? Option A, HPLC with C18 column. Option B, gel filtration chromatography with Cifidex G50 column. Option C, SDS page following gel extraction. And option D, gel filtration chromatography with DEAE Cifidex G50 column. So, which of the following technique is used for purification of radioactive labeled oligonucleotides ok we have one answer option A HPLC with C18 column anyone else wants to answer ok we still have option A I will give you one hint. So, in the previous slide I told you how do we do the radioactive labeling? We are labeling the phosphate group, right? So, it is a heavier isotope of phosphate. So, if I have to separate the radio labeled from the non labeled or unlabeled uh, fractions, how will I separate it? So, if I am saying that I have radio labeled oligonucleotide that means I have a heavier isotope of phosphate that has been attached to the oligonucleotide. So, if I want to separate the labeled oligonucleotide from the unlabeled one I will do the separation based on size right because now the radio labeled oligonucleotide will be heavier in like heavier uh, based on its molecular weight. So, to separate that we have to use a technique that can be that can do the separation based on size. So, now tell me if anyone can answer. we have answer option China says option B rest everyone is saying option D ok at least you have reached to gel filtration chromatography so gel filtration chromatography is a technique where we can separate two molecules based on its size we will discuss uh, in detail about chromatography in the subsequent lectures but gel filtration by the name gel filtration means we have a chromatography column where we can have different molecules separated based on its size similar to what we were doing in SDS page. So, in SDS page also we had a gel where we were separating the molecules based on its size. The heavier was 
at the top the low uh, the lightest was at the bottom similarly gel filtration column kind of has the same principle okay so separation will be based on size now gel filtration chromatography is done using a cefedex g50 column so this dea cefedex and cefedex has difference uh, in that dea stands for diethyl amino ethyl so diethyl amino ethyl beads are actually used for anion exchange not gel filtration chromatography okay for gel filtration chromatography we use only cefedex g50 column so basically these are uh, these columns have uh, cefedex uh, beads in it which has different pore sizes okay so g50 will have certain uh, size of the pore and based on the pore size all the molecules that can that are bigger than the pore will elute first then the molecules that are very small will move through each and every pore and the molecules that are kind of equal to the size of the pore will pass through some of the pores and come out so basically the heavier molecule will uh, come out of the column first then the medium sized molecule and then the lightest molecule will uh, elute the last okay so that is the basic gel filtration chromatography and to separate these radio labeled oligonucleotides now i told you it is labeled with a heavier isotope that means the labeled oligonucleotide will be heavier in size than the unlabeled oligonucleotide so labeled oligonucleotide will elute first and the unlabeled oligonucleotide will elute later okay so it is very similar to sds page sds page is generally used for proteins okay so uh, the concept is very similar to sds page in sds page also the lighter molecules will move faster the heavier molecules will move slower so you will have a separation based on size in this case also the lighter molecules are moving faster but it is move, now moving through each and every pore so imagine a column like this and we have a outlet so this column is filled with resin which has a particular pore size okay this column is filled with resin which has a particular pore size okay so now if a molecule is small enough to enter each and every pore so what will happen that molecule will now enter each and every resin and then come out okay whereas if we have a bigger molecule that cannot enter the system so it will basically move directly and come out faster so the smaller molecule will take more time because it is traveling now through each and every bead and then coming out whereas the larger molecule will elute uh, before the smaller molecule because the larger molecule cannot enter these pores so it will just move wherever uh, it is getting space between the void spaces of the beads and it will come out faster okay so that is the principle of gel filtration chromatography and we use cefedex g50 column for separating the radio labeled nucleotide from the unlabeled one okay is this clear to everybody yes ma'am okay. let's move to the next question what is the role of t4 pnk in gel mobility shift assay what is the role of t4 pnk in gel mobility shift assay option a it reduces the random binding of the radioactive label option b it prevents the metallic ion contamination of gel option c it catalyzes the sense and anti sense dna binding and option d it catalyzes the binding of radioactive atp to dna oligomers so what does what is the role of t4 pnk in gel mobility shift assay
anyone wants to answer this question so we have one answer option b it prevents the metallic ion contamination okay anyone else see it's okay if you don't know the answer it's good to try answering the question that will make you involved in the class as well so it will make you interested more uh, to understand what is happening in each and every question okay okay we have more answers now option d it catalyzes the binding of radioactive atp to dna oligomer that is actually the correct answer option d so t4 pnk is actually used in gel mobility shift assay to uh, bind the radioactive atp to dna oligomer so for gel mobility shift assay we have to first label the dna dna molecule or the oligonucleotide that we have so let's say we have a dna molecule so first we'll have to label it so that we can visualize it through auto radiography as i explained previously then what do we do in gel mobility shift assay we basically study the dna protein interaction okay we study dna protein interaction right so to study this dna protein interaction now first we we have to label this dna so that we can visualize it on auto radiograph then we will have the protein molecules bind to the uh, we will have the protein molecules bound to the dna and then we will see how the binding of protein to the dna is affecting its electrophoretic mobility okay so the first step where we have to label the dna with uh, radioactive phosphate what we do is we use t4 pnk what is t4 pnk it is polynucleotide kinase polynucleotide kinase so if you remember the dna structure i showed you in the dna structure we had a po4 minus group right so in this po4 uh, phosphate group we have to now replace this phosphate with p32 that is the radioactive phosphate so what we will do we will use t4 pnk what will it do phosphonucleotide kinase what will, what does it do it basically activates the phosphate site by replacing it with oh once the site is activated now when now we can do dna synthesis using a polymerase where we will add the nucleotide atp that is radioactive so instead of normal atp we will use atp that has the phosphate that is radio labeled with the p32 the heavy isotope of phosphate okay and when we will use this uh, nucleotide instead of normal atp so wherever the dna will have alanine uh, sorry not alanine adenine wherever the dna will have adenine it will incorporate this adenine instead of the regular adenine and each adenine residue the phosphate will have a p32 that is a radioactive phosphate and that's how the whole dna will be radio labeled with the radioactive phosphate wherever the adenine uh, base will be present so t4 pnk basically catalyzes the binding of radioactive atp to dna oligomer that is clear okay moving to the next question dpc treated water is used to inactivate dash option a proteases option b nucleases option c rnas option d lipase so dpc treated water is used to inactivate what 
China is on answered. Option C, RNA. Anyone else wants to answer? Why do we use DTC? Yes, everyone is answering option C, RNA. That is the correct answer. So, DPC is basically diethyl pyrocarbonate. So, it is a compound that is used to inactivate the RNA. So, the active site of RNA has histidine and other amino acid residues. So, what does it, this DPC do? DPC basically attach to the histidine side chain and blocks it. So, now the RNA, so RNAs can basically degrade RNA. Okay. RNAs can degrade RNA and how does it degrade RNA? It can basically chop off the phosphodiester uh, bonds of the RNA molecule. So, if we are let us say isolating RNA, if I want to isolate RNA, I have to use a water that is free from RNAs, right? I have to use water that is free from RNAs because if RNAs is present in my water, it will chop off my RNA, right? So, for that, we treat the water with DPC. So, whatever RNAs will be there, the active site of RNAs and like active site of RNAs enzyme will be de, uh, inactivated by DPC, okay? And that is how the enzyme will no longer be active and thus the enzyme will no longer be able to chop off the RNA molecule, okay? So, this is very important in e every uh, molecular biology experiment if you do not want RNA in your, uh, if you do not want uh, RNA to get degraded in your samples, you should use DPC treated water that can actually protect the RNA samples from getting degraded. So, RNA is, is a very common enzyme, okay, it is present everywhere and when I say it is present everywhere, I literally mean everywhere. So, it is present in your hand. So, when you are doing RNA isolation, it is always suggested that you wear gloves, you clean, wear clean fresh gloves, you use DPC treated water, whatever reagent you are using, use everything fresh and sterile, autoclave everything, sterilize everything, surface and sterilize the micro tips, whatever you are using because RNAs can be present anywhere and it, if even a single molecule of RNAs come in contact with uh, to your sample, your sample will get degraded, ok. So, that is why removing or inactivating RNAs enzyme is very important and DPC is the best option to do so. Ma'am, could you please repeat that uh, gel shifting assay question again? Gel shifting assay, this one. Yeah. So, uh, what is your doubt exactly? From the process of this. How gel shifting assay is done? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question uh, coming up. So, that will actually explain. Like, I have a figure there. I will explain there. Okay. Okay, ma'am. This is actually the question. So, dash is used for analyzing the sam samples in gel mobility shift assays. So, option A, 15% non-denaturating polyacrylamide gel. Option B, 15% denaturating polyacrylamide gel. Option C, 5% denaturating uh, non-denaturating polyacrylamide gel. And option D, 5% denaturating polyacrylamide gel. So, which of the following uh, gels can be used for gel mobility shift assay? Anyone who knows the answer? So, we can use a 5% non-denaturating page for separating. So, I will explain what gel mobility shift assay is. So, 
वी आर डूइंग दिस एसे टू स्टडी द डी एन ए प्रोटीन इंटरक्शन ओके सो लेट से देर इज अ प्रोटीन दैट इज बाइंडिंग टू माई डी एन ए ओके सो इट कुड बी अ ट्रांसपेक्ट ट्रांसक्रिप्शन फैक्टर और इट कुड बी एनी डी एन ए बाइंडिंग प्रोटीन ओके इट कुड बी एनी रेगुलेटरी प्रोटीन दैट इज बाइंडिंग टू डी एन ए ओके नाउ आई वॉन्ट टू सी दिस पर्टिकुलर प्रोटीन वेदर इट इज बाइंडिंग टू माई डी एन ए और नॉट सो इफ आई रन द डी एन ए अलोन इन अ जेल वॉट एवर बेस्ड ऑन इट्स मॉलिकुलर साइज सो लेट से माई डी एन ए मॉलिकुलर साइज ऑफ माई डी एन ए इज हंड्रेड किलो डाल्टन सो इट विल गिव अ सिंगल बैंड एट हंड्रेड किलो डाल्टन नाउ इफ आई नाउ इंक्री इफ आई नाउ इंक्यूबेट माई डी एन ए with the protein of interest or with a mixture of protein to see if there is any protein that is interacting with this dna okay so now if i put a low concentration of protein so there will be some molecules of protein so let's say there is a protein of 25 kilo dalton that is interacting with this 100 kilo dalton dna so when i have added it in low concentration what is happening only probably one molecule of protein bound to the dna okay so this is my dna molecule and one molecule of protein uh binds to this dna molecule so we get a shift in the band now the total size of this whole complex will be 125 kilo dalton because now i have a dna of 100 kilo dalton to which one molecule of protein is bound so that protein had 25 kilo dalton weight so total molecular weight will be 125 kilo dalton so now the mobility will be shifted so from 100 kilo dalton we will see a shift of 25 kilo dalton then i gradually keep on increasing the protein concentration so in the next well let's say i have added more concentration of protein so these are separate wells okay these are separate wells so on the first well i have loaded only dna in the second well i have loaded very dilute con uh, sample of protein with the dna okay i have allowed the dna to uh, incubate with the protein and after th after the incubation period i have loaded that sample to see if there is any shift in the mobility then I, in the next well i have added a further higher concentration of protein along with my dna so in this case what is happening my dna molecule has two proteins uh basically two protein molecules bound together so two molecules if two molecules are binding that means the total molecular weight will be now 100 plus 25 plus 25 so that will give me total of 150 <coughs> so if two molecules are binding there will be further shift now if i give a further higher concentration of protein what will happen the dna will be completely saturated with the uh dna will be completely saturated with the protein now there are three molecules of protein that are interacting now three molecules of protein that means the total complex now has 175 kilo dalton size so there will be a further shift in the mobility so you can see the, the electrophoretic mobility the speed by which the sample is moving it was fastest when dna was alone then when i added a low concentration of protein it slightly uh moved upward there is a shift in the band then when i added a higher concentration of protein there is again a shift in the band so so that is why it is called a gel shift mobility so we have a mobility in the oh sorry we have a shift in the mobility when we see the samples on the gel okay so there is a shift in the band there is a shift in the mobility of the sample so that is why it is called gel mobility shift assay is this clear now yes ma'am okay. so any doubt regarding how this uh, analysis is done no 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 ma'am okay great so 
moving to the next question in a super shift experiment dash is added to bind the protein prior to forming dna protein complex option a radioactive labeled phosphorus option b beta mercaptoethanol option c tracking dye and option d 2 micrograms of protein specific antibody so super shift as experiment is basically a modified version of the gel mobility shift assay so what do we add uh, to bind to the protein prior to forming the dna protein complex anybody knows the answer to this option d shine that is option d 2 microgram of protein specific antibody that is the correct answer so now i have explained you what shift uh, what does shift mean right so we have the free dna when protein is bound to it we saw a shift in the mobility right now in the super shift what we do first we incubate the protein with the antibody that binds to the protein okay so that antibody will now bind to the protein so my protein was 25 kilo dalton let's say my antibody is 150 kilo dalton okay so now this complex itself became 175 kilo dalton right now i instead of so initially what i was doing i was incubating the protein with dna right now what i what i will do i will incubate the protein antibody complex with dna okay so protein was 25 kilo dalton dna was 100 kilo dalton so i was seeing a shift of 25 kilo dalton but in this case the protein antibody complex is 175 kilo dalton and the dna is 100 kilo dalton so i will get a shift of 275 kilo dalton so that means one band is at 100 kilo dalton the next band will be at 275 kilo dalton so it is called a super shift okay so in this case you were seeing the shift at a smaller rate right but in case of super shift you will directly see a shift from this position to this position or probably higher okay do you understand why because now we have bound a further heavier molecule and why do we add this antibody this antibody can actually help us detect which particular protein is binding to the dna okay so that is the purpose of adding the antibody so if we are adding a mixture of protein here when we are adding the protein and dna together to incubate if we are adding a mixture of different proteins and i want to see which protein is actually interacting i can use a antibody against a known protein and if that antibody is binding to this protein and we see such a shift that means the protein that is specific for this antibody that is interacting with this dna okay of course you have to run controls where your antibody should not bind to the dna and your protein should bind to that antibody like that you have to see some controls but this is what super shift means i hope this is clear what does this super shift mean moving on to the next question which of the following extracts would you use to identify a transcription factor for a gene x option a cytoplasmic extract option b nuclear extract option c mitochondrial extract and option d surface protein extract so what extract do you use if you want to identify a transcription factor for answering this question you should know where transcription occurs in the cell if you know that you should be able to answer that question so generally transcription occurs in the inside the nucleus of the cell because inside the nucleus we have the dna present so transcription factors will bind to the dna and uh 
synthesize RNA from the DNA. That process is called transcription. So, since transcription occurs inside the nucleus, transcription factors will be present inside the nucleus. So, nuclear extract will be used for identifying any transcription factor for any particular gene. Okay. So, transcription is basically a process of conversion of DNA to RNA. Okay. It is part of your central dogma. So, DNA to RNA. So, inside the nucleus all, so all the DNA, uh, all the organisms that have DNA as the genomic material, the DNA is present inside the nucleus. All the multicellular organism, they have a nucleus and the DNA is present inside that nucleus. So, the transcription process that is the conversion of DNA to RNA that will also happen inside the nucleus. So, for that to happen the transcription factors have to present inside the nucleus. So, if I want to study one of the transcription factor I have to take the nuclear extract that is clear. Okay. Moving on to the next question DNA's footprinting is performed to dash option A sequence the DNA option B know the restriction sites on the genomic DNA. Option C, identify exact protein binding sites on the DNA and option D, cut the genomic DNA into smaller fragments. So, DNA's footprinting is performed to sequence the DNA to know the restriction site on the genomic DNA to identify the exact protein binding site or to cut the genomic DNA into smaller fragments. Okay, Ami has answered option C. Identify exact protein binding sites on the DNA, that is the correct answer. So, DNA's footprinting is to find out at which location the protein is binding. So, till now we studied about gel uh, mobility shift assay where we are studying whether the protein is binding to the DNA or not, okay, or whether a particular protein is binding to the DNA. But now I want to find in the whole DNA strand what is the location where the DNA is binding. So, for that, what do we do? It is a very simple experiment where we have the DNA. So, think of it like a big rope, okay. So, it is a long rope, and now let us say I give you a scissor and ask you to cut the rope at random location. Okay, So, you can cut the rope at any point, right? But if now I have a rope and I uh, tie this center part of the rope with a metal piece, okay? I add a metal guard to this rope at the center part and now I ask you to cut it with the scissors. So, you can cut it here, you can cut it here, but you cannot cut this part, right? So, then if I analyze these fragments, I can see these fragments, I can see these fragments and this whole part will be one sig single fragment. So, I will understand, okay, the metal part was bound to this part of the rope. Similarly, for DNA, we have the DNA, we have the radio labeled DNA, we have the protein bound to the DNA. So, wherever the DNA is bound to the protein. If we do a DNA is one digestion where the random chopping off of DNA is happening, this part where the protein is bound, that part will not get chopped and when we will analyze the fragments on gel, a DNA that is not bound to the protein, this is the control basically. The DNA that is not bound to the protein will have multiple fragments. Okay. But DNA that is bound to the protein, this part will be, will not be having any fragment. That means, we have a footprint here. So, if we run different uh, protein, if we uh, run different protein bound DNA fragments, so we can see, okay, this particular protein is binding at this side, this another, some other protein is there that is binding on some other side. So, we can have multiple footprints like that, okay. 
is this technique clear yes ma'am yes ma'am okay moving on to the next question question number 16 dash is used to denature the secondary structures in rna so what do we use to denature the secondary structure of rna option a urea option b rnas option c sds and option d formaldehyde okay shaina is option uh, answer sorry shaina is answered option d formaldehyde yes that is the correct answer so for so rna generally forms different secondary structure you have hairpin hairpin loop structure you have stem structure so all these secondary structures have to be denatured when analyzed on gel so uh, if you run the rna without denaturing these secondary structures so the secondary structures make them very compact and all the samples will be uh, run at the bottom part of the gel because it's very difficult to resolve these secondary uh, resolve the rna with these secondary structures present so if we denature these secondary structure it will be open like in case of protein we were denaturing the proteins with sds in this case we denature the rna with formaldehyde so that it can open up and it can be separated based on its molecular weight okay so it is very similar to sds page why we were using sds in case of protein separation similarly we are using formaldehyde in case of rna separation moving on to the next question which staining dye is used in rna agarose gel option a silver stain option b etbr option c kumasi brilliant blue and option d safranin so what do we use to stain rna yes option okay we have option c kumasi anyone else wants to answer so kumasi brilliant blue is actually used for staining protein so silver stain and kumasi brilliant blue these are used for staining protein so etbr is the correct answer here etbr stands for ethidium bromide if you remember in the previous uh, lecture i have explained how ethidium bromide is used for staining nucleic acid okay so rn like dna rna is also a nucleic acid so it also has the sugar phosphate backbone so that sugar phosphate backbone is basically intercalated by this ethidium bromide and it's a orange fluorescent dye okay it has orange fluorescent okay so because of this ethidium bromide will stain the nucleic acid so for dna gel if you remember from the previous uh, lecture in uh, for doing dna gel electrophoresis for separating dna what we were doing we were doing agarose gel electrophoresis right in the agarose gel we were adding a dye called ethidium bromide and that ethidium bromide when the dna was running through the gel the ethidium bromide could intercalate to the backbone of the dna and give orange fluorescence so i've shown a gel picture also you can go back to my slides and video to refer to that picture similarly rna gels are also stained in the similar manner they are also stained using ethidium bromide they also stain the rna with orange fluorescence which we can easily visualize in a uv transilluminator okay so option b is the correct answer okay moving on to the last question of this discussion dash is used as destaining solution for rna agarose gel what do we use for destaining uh, the rna agarose gel so we saw we are using etbr to stain the gel what do how do we destain it option a 1% nacl option b distilled water option c 1 molar acetic acid and option d 0.5 molar ammonium acetate so 
so the correct answer is option d 0.5 molar ammonium acetate so why do we destain it basically for rna agarose gel we are not adding the etbr in the gel instead we after running the gel we dip the gel in the etbr solution so what happens sometimes the background of the gel also gets stained so it's very difficult to visualize the band if the background is also fluorescing with orange it's a very high it's a highly fluorescent dye so it can sometimes stain the background so to destain the background so that we can see the band separately against a lighter background we use 0.5 molar ammonium acetate to destain the gel after staining it okay so this was the last question of this discussion anybody has any doubt in any of the questions or any of the techniques that have been discussed here so i hope the concept of electrophoresis the electrophoretic mobility that is very clear to you ma'am question number 9 question number 9 this one okay what is your doubt in this 10 next next to this one yeah yeah what uh, now tell me what is your doubt in this no actually i missed the question because internet connection okay okay so I basically uh, the question was what is the role of t4 pnk in this gel mobility shift assay so i hope you understood the gel mobility shift assay right yes ma'am yes ma'am so in that so you saw in this uh, in this assay we are visualizing this dna right dna bound to the protein so this visualization is actually done by auto radiography for that we label the dna with a heavy isotope of uh, phosphate so we label the dna with a p32 phosphate okay instead of regular phosphate we used a radioactive phosphate to label this dna so that once the dna is bound to the protein or the free dna we can visualize the dna on the gel okay so for that purpose we have to label the dna with the radioactive phosphate and for labeling we use this enzyme polynucleotide kinase p4 polynucleotide kinase what it does it activates that phosphate group that is already present in the dna and that phosphate group can be replaced by a radioactive nucleotide so the dntps that we add the datp dgtp whatever we are adding the atp we are adding radioactive atp so instead of regular phosphate it has a radioactive phosphate so it, wherever the dna will have adenine residues this radioactive adenine will get incorporated so the dna will ultimately get labeled with the p32 isotope okay so wherever the dna will have a base in that all the places will be labeled with p32 isotope so that is the role of p4 pnk in the gel mobility shift assay it catalyzes the binding of radioactive atp to dna oligomer is that clear okay ma'am okay ma'am so the phosphate of atp will be radioactive labeled yes phosphate of atp will be radioactive labeled and that atp will get incorporated in your in your dna oligomer so let's mm -hmm. say i have a so here uh, in this figure so i have the dna molecule right and then i am adding protein to the dna molecule so before this incubation of protein with the dna i have to label this dna then only i can visualize it in gel visualize it in gel so to label this dna basically i take this dna fragment and then treat it with t4 pnk and the radioactive atp so what will happen wherever we will have the adenine bases those adenine bases will now be replaced by the radioactive atp and we will get a radio labeled dna okay 
then this DNA can be incubated with the protein then this DNA can be incubated with the protein of different concentration and then we can observe the shift in the mobility. Okay ma'am. Ma'am, it is necessary that we uh, label it with just uh, T4 PNK or uh, some more things can be used like GFP or RFP? So, uh, depends on how you want to visualize it. So, for in case of DNA, it is very easy to label it with a radioactive phosphate. Nowadays, people are using, that's why uh, super shift assay has been developed. So, nowadays, instead of labeling that DNA molecule with a radioactive radio label, uh, what people do is people use different kinds of antibody to counter stain it and then visualize it. So, uh, since uh, labeling with radioactive compound is hazardous you have to be very careful while handling radioactive stuff so that's why people are developing new techniques like antibody labeling and all but then for dna in case of dna p32 uh, isotope labeling is very commonly uh, used technique so that is why it is this is now very kind of harmful or also yes, yes. so, so that is why people, people nowadays yeah, nowadays people actually use antibodies to uh, visualize. So antibody will bind to that particular position. It's like West, how you do western blotting for proteins. For DNA also, we have northern blotting and southern blotting. So I think we'll study about these different kind of blotting techniques in the next uh, series. I, I'm not sure. but then so, yeah. so in gel mobility shifting assay, it is necessary to do it with uh, only uh, PNK, I mean, uh, no, like no, no. radio. So, no, 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 that is not necessary. You can have other staining procedures also. So, PNK is basically the enzyme that is catalyzing this incorporation of radio labeled uh, ATP. But, so, uh, if you don't want to radio label it, if you want to stain it with something else, if you want to tag it, tag your DNA, so what you can do is you can, at the end of this DNA, you can have a, a colorimetric tag or fluorometric tag. So, wherever your DNA will move, the, that portion will fluoresce. That portion will have some fluorescence and you can actually visualize the gel under UV light. Okay. So those kind of techniques are also common these days. So mostly these types of techniques are called end labeling. So the end part of the DNA is